Hello all, uh, my name is Sam and I will be your host for today's webinar while Gemma and Don take a little bit of a break. Uh, thank you for joining us for our IELTS Listening and Reading Masterclass today hosted by IELTS expert Rocco Negro, who you can see on the screen as well. Uh, Rocco is an IELTS expert located in Brisbane, Australia with 25 years experience in English language teaching. 20 of those years have been involved directly with IELTS. Uh, he's worked across Australia, China, Japan, and on a host of online platforms and joins us here today to give you his absolute best tips and advice, as well as his full walkthrough of the IELTS uh, listening and reading sections. Uh, this webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes and then we'll close it out with a 15 minute Q&A session. Uh, so make sure to ask all of your IELTS listening and reading questions, uh, either through the Zoom chat or on the Facebook live comments. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Rocco. All right, well, thank you very much, Sam. And welcome everyone to our our masterclass today on IELTS listening and reading. Okay, so um, let's get started, shall we? So our aims for today, let's have a look, about emphasizing the need to improve your English every day. And with IELTS, it's good to do practice tests, of course, but it's important to do practice of listening and reading outside of IELTS material as well. Um, we'll also look at um, IELTS assessment and some of the language skills that examiners look for and some of the mistakes that you can, you can avoid. Uh, the first thing to think about is whether you're taking the academic or general training. Um, you know, do, do you need it for school or for professional registration? Is it something that your work requires? What do you need to do? Is it essays like at university or do you have to write reports? And then consider if general training, if the general training test is an option for you. Now, if you're not sure, speak directly to the organization or the institution and get it directly from them and they will tell you whether they require the academic or the general training. And in some cases, maybe they, they accept both. So we're looking at reading and listening today, but we can start with looking at reading. There's academic or general. Now, in the case of reading, both cases, both tests are 60 minutes long. Uh, about three sections and with 40 questions. That's very similar. But there are some differences between the two. Um, you'll find that all the topics are of general interest, uh, three sections and a variety of styles. There might be a logical argument, a descriptive or a narrative. In the training though, there are some differences. In section one, you might get some short, uh, short pieces of, of text based on survival skills. Um, maybe there might be like eight or nine or six, uh, perhaps even uh, short advertisements, for example, that you have to read. Um, section two, on the other hand, are two work-related texts. So in some ways, you can kind of prepare a little bit for that one, you'll, you'll expect something in a business or work-related context. There are two articles for that one. And then there's also section three, which, which is one long text, uh, a descriptive text, but it's in a general context. You'll find though that um, in the academic, you'll have perhaps three long articles, but in the general test, there's just the one long article. When it comes to the question types though, there are actually, um, the question types are pretty much the same. So for example, in the heading, uh, you might get a headings question in the academic uh, or the general, multiple choice, academic or general, true, false, not given, also in both of them as well. So even if you're preparing for the general training, you can still do a bit of practice with some of the academic articles because the question types are quite often the same. There might be some exception. For example, labeling a diagram tends to be something that happens more in the academic. 
Now, um, what do you think? How often do you read something serious, like a, a serious uh, newspaper or magazine article? Or do you, is that something that you perhaps do every day? Is it something that you do two or three times a week, just once a week? or rarely. I wonder what your what are your habits like? Perhaps you can just share with us. Um, just choose a number, everyone. Do you choose number one, number two, number three, or number four? Okay, interesting. Wow, a lot of different responses there. Fantastic. Interesting. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's, that's fine. Now, um, I'm kind of hoping that you're mentioning maybe option number one or option number two, uh, particularly if a lot of you um, have goals at a higher band, six or maybe seven or eight. If you're aiming at those higher bands, it's important to be consistent, I feel, with your reading. Doing something every day uh, is very helpful. It helps maintain your level. If you're doing, look at option three once a week. I understand people are busy. Perhaps they um, they work, they have family commitments, and so they perhaps one day set aside for practicing English. That's fine. But the problem is you can lose whatever you've gained if you only do it once a week. Something every day I think is 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 helpful. Two or three times a week is also useful. But one of the advantages of doing something every day, if you find it's a bit hard to get motivated, what I recommend is keep it short, just maybe 15 minutes or half an hour. And then, and then perhaps that becomes a bit more manageable. All right, um, let's get into a bit more specifics. With reading, there's... Three, there are three types of skills, skimming, scanning, and reading for details. The skimming is um, handy. You look at the heading. You can look at diagrams, perhaps. Scanning, you're looking for particular keywords. Sometimes in the question, you'll get a, you get a bit of a helping hand. They'll have a name of a person or name of a place or mention some dates. That's quick. You can scan the article to find out where those answers are located. Reading for detail. So remember, that's important. Read for detail. I know some people, they highlight the keyword in the question and they scan the article for the keyword and they make a match that way. That's handy for locating the, 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 the question or the answer. But it's also important to, to read for detail. Don't just scan for the keyword. Make sure that you read the sentence or the paragraph or read the full sentence of the question. Uh, to make sure that the whole lot is mentioned. But you know, um, in total, one full test would contain between 2,200 and 2,750 words. That's a lot. So it's kind of nice if you can sit down and read the whole lot, but that's quite difficult for some. So maybe it's important to prioritize, maybe look at questions first, perhaps. Oh, we did that one. Um, let's have a look at some of the question types. Multiple choice. Uh, quite often in the reading, you you choose one correct answer from four. That's very common. Sometimes you choose two correct answers from a list of five or three from a list of six, sometimes like that. Um, the great thing about multiple choice is that um, the answers uh, usually appear in order in, in the text, which is great, which means you don't have to begin with the first one. You can begin with whichever question is the fastest to locate. So for example, if question three has a name of a person, I would begin there because a name of a person is very, you can uh, locate that in the text very quickly. That name of the person might be mentioned in paragraph four. So question three might be there. So therefore, you know that question one and question two would appear before that earlier in the text. Question four, question five will appear afterwards. So begin with the question that's quickest to locate and then go backwards or forwards from there. There are other types of questions called identifying and true, false, not given or yes, no, not given. 
This is pretty much the same type of question, but how it differs is that true and false looks for factual information, whereas yes or no would look at the right of view, that kind of thing. These are normally in order as well. Uh, now there are matching tasks. For example, you might get a list of statements and you have to match the statement to which paragraph it appears in. And that's in a jumbled order. It doesn't always appear in order. So a little bit tricky. My advice with that type of task, because information in the paragraph, it's not a summary of the paragraph, it's a small piece of information that's hiding somewhere in a paragraph. It can be a good idea to leave that type of question to last and do it when you're a little bit more familiar with the article after doing a couple of other questions like multiple choice or truth, false, not given, that kind of thing. Now, another kind of matching task is matching a heading to a paragraph. Now, in this case, um, the headings are all jumbled. They're not in the, in the same order. But perhaps this is a good one to do first, like get an overview of the paragraph first before choosing your option. Um, sometimes you have to match features or uh, the ending of a sentence. Sometimes I'll give you half a sentence and the other half of the sentence are jumbled in multiple choice options. Um, but the sentence endings, the options are jumbled, but the answers appear in order in the text. There are completion tasks, for example, completing the sentence. Maybe there's, there are one or two or three words missing. And in, in this case, remember to copy the words directly from the article. Um, these appear in order, but there are some others that completion tasks that are not in order. Sometimes you get um, a summary or note completion, labeling a diagram. Sometimes a di that can be in a jumbled order, um, completing a table as well. Now with a flow chart, be careful with these. Sometimes they are mentioned in order of time or chronological order. And so what you'll notice with an article is that they are not, the information is not always arranged in chronological order. Paragraph one might talk about the 1800s and then paragraph two jumps to the 20th century, but paragraph three jumps back to the 1800s again. So just watch out for that, because not all articles are arranged chronologically or in, in the case of time. Um, then also there are short answer questions. These are things where um, you have to, they ask things like who, what, where, when, why, and you have to answer within maybe one, two or three words. These are normally in order as well. Okay, let's have a look at one of these tasks spe specifically, and we'll look at true, false, not given. And one of the reasons we, we're looking at this one is because some people are not a big fan of not given. Uh, there's a, sometimes a challenge between false and, and not given. So let's have a look at this. Now, when it comes to this type of question, and the same rule applies to yes, no, not given, um, I find that there are two types of word in the question. There's one word which is for location, to help you locate the answer. And there's another type of word which helps you decide the answer. Now, have a look at question one here. Question one says, Aboriginal Australians are descended from the inhabitants of Africa. Now, one of these words is, will help us locate the answer. Now, you might think, well, look, it could be Aboriginal Australians because there's a capital A for Australians. But however, this whole article is about Aboriginal Australians. So that's not really that helpful. But there's another word. Can you guess what that word is that helps us locate where the answer is? 
have a guess, everyone. Do you, which word do you think in sentence one would help us locate the answer? All right. If you're thinking Africa, you're probably on the right on the right path there. Um, so, look at the word Africa, and then you can scan the article for where it's located, and you can see here. Ah, hang on. Africa is mentioned in paragraph one. So, in this particular case, we can say that um, the answer for number one is, is somewhere in the first paragraph. Now, then you can think about which word in the sentence helps us decide the answer. So, have a look at the sentence. I think, first of all, just put not given aside. Don't use not given. Uh, as one of your first choices. Don't think, is it true, false, not given? Just move not given out of the picture and just decide if it's true or false. We only use not given as the last option, not as a first option. First option is true or false, which means we find something similar to the sentence or we find something that's, that contrasts and usually these words can be adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions. Look at the first sentence here. Aboriginal Australians are descended from the inhabitants of Africa. So if you think about, well, which word can I, con can I contrast? And the, the major one here is descended from. So think about true or false as in two options. Option one, they descended from Africa. Option two, which is false, would have to be they're descended from somewhere else. It's either descended from Africa, descended from somewhere else. We only use not given if we don't know where they are descended from. So have a look at the first paragraph. Just for now, decide if it's true or false. You don't have to think about whether it's not given. So what do you think, guys? Is it true? or false? I think the answer is, is here. It says here, they ventured out of Africa 30 years ago. And the Aboriginal Australians were part of this migration. So we can say there for there's your, there's your evidence. So that matches true. They did descend from Africa. So do you see, we haven't even bothered to look at not given. Look at the second sentence. They settled in Australia 80,000 years ago. So the key word here is settled. When did they settle, settle in Australia? Was it 80,000 years ago? That's true. Or another time? When was it 80,000 or a different time? They're the two options. And let's leave not given out of the picture. So the answers are in order, so we, we can go next paragraph. 80,000 or another time. So have a look. Look at perhaps the second paragraph. So you can see here that They arrived in a single migration to Australia, at least 50,000. So this contrasts the sentence. They didn't arrive 80,000 years ago, they arrived 50,000 years ago. See, and we haven't even bothered to look at not given, we haven't needed to. So you should always be juggling between the two options, true or false, or of course, yes or no. So have a look at the third question. Are they the most genetically diverse? Most means they're number one. Or are they that's or they are they the second most genetically diverse race in the world? The most, second most, least. But anyway, false is they are not the most. They are second or third. Have a look, perhaps from the second half of paragraph two or the third paragraph. Have a look there, everyone. They're the most, the most genetically diverse 
or they're not the most. Someone else is. Hmm. If you're having trouble finding, well, I don't know if they're the most, the most genetically diverse, or are they the second most, the least? It mentions genetic diversity at the end of the second paragraph, but I'm looking for the most diverse. Hmm. Interesting. They talk about genetic diversity between different parts of Australia, but I can't see any example whether they're the most in the world. So in this case, I can't decide if it's true or false. Then finally, I go to my third option, not given. You use not given as a last option. Okay. So basic reading advice. Look out for synonyms. That's the big thing in reading and of course in writing. Settled in Australia, but in the article they said arrived in Australia. Distractors, be careful. Genetic diversity is not the same as culturally diverse. That's different, different meaning. But sometimes they put these things in the question to, to distract you. So watch out for those. So what advice can we give you? Look, it's nice if you can read the article first. That's handy if you have a good reading speed, but you've only got an hour. If you struggle to do that, read the questions first, highlight the keywords and skim the article to see if you can locate where they are quickly. Underline your keywords. Remember, even if you're taking the computer delivered test, you can still click and highlight. Be careful of the, the number of words allowed in your answer. No more than two words, no more than three words, or no more than two words and or a number. Oh, by the way, watch out for that one. If it says no more than two words and or a number, you can actually have three parts to your answer. You can have two words and a number. That's actually possible. Or one word and a number, or just two words, or just one, one number is also okay. If you see words that you don't know, don't worry about it. Um, try to use the context perhaps to try and work it out, but don't waste or don't use up all of your time trying to figure out what this word means. Uh, time is valuable. Um, if you don't know, try to work it out. If you can't work it out, leave it and move on. Maybe it's not important. Um, in the academic one, by the way, if there's something technical, they'll provide you a little definition at the bottom of the article. If you're stuck on one question, don't worry about it. The difficult questions are worth one point. The easy questions are worth one point. Um, give it some time, maybe leave it and come back to it if you want to briefly, but don't use all your time just for one question. Move on. Yeah, each question is worth one point each. There's no penalty if your answer is wrong. So just have a guess. Even if you don't know, just have a guess, write something. Um, to give yourself every chance. Now, let's do a bit of work on listening. What can we tell you about that? So the listening test is actually 30 minutes. Um, there is 10 minutes afterwards to transfer your answers in the paper test, but there are four sections and in total 40 questions. So 10 questions per section. Section one and section three are kind of similar in that it's a conversation between two or three people. Um, section two and four are kind of similar. It's just one person speaking a monologue. So that's handy for practice, you know, um, practice listening to both monologues, one person, and practice listening to dialogues, two people or three people. But section one and section two are also similar because they are on a very familiar everyday topic. But section three and four are also similar because they look at formal or academic kind of topics. Let's do a bit of 
listening practice. Don't worry, it's not too not too challenging. It's just a, a section one practice. Let's have a let's have a look. Uh, just eight questions. Now, in the listening test, they do give you some time before the recording to preview the questions. And they give you some time afterwards to review your, your questions as well. Use that time carefully. Um, look at the titles or headings. So you'll see here we've got um, date, time, tickets. Do you see in, in bold on the left hand side? That's very helpful. It's also useful, don't just focus on one question. Try to focus on maybe two or three questions at the same time just in case you've, you've missed it, keep an eye on the next one. So if you're looking at question one about the date, also have the, at the back of your mind, keep an eye on if they mention about time as well. And remember that there's always a good chance they'll mention more than one time or more than one date, perhaps. Um, they can give you some distractors like that. And look at the type of um, answer that you need, look at, Question eight, for example, book. Think about, hmm, is that a verb or a noun? Maybe it's a verb. What is something that you book? Well, look at the heading. At the top, it says Theatre Royal Plymouth. Oh, it's a theatre. What do you book at a theatre? Maybe book a seat, uh, book your tickets, uh, or something like that. So you can, you can um, preview that. So, guys, let's... Have a practice. If you've got pen and paper, you could just maybe write something down or keep a mental note if you like. Let's let's have a bit of a listen, a bit of a practice, and see how you go. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, Theatre Royal Plymouth. Oh, uh, hello. I'd like to make a booking, please. Yes. What is it you want to see? The imposter. Right. And which day did you want to come? Friday the 25th. Just a moment and I'll check availability on the computer. Oh, sorry. We're fully booked for that performance. Oh, dear. Um, what about the following day, then? The 26th? Yes, that's OK. We've got two performances on that day. One at 3.30 and one at 7. Which would you prefer? Oh, the later one, please. Mm -hmm. How many people? Well, there are four of us. Are there any concessions? Any children? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, my daughters are 15 and 12. Do they get concessions? Only the 12-year-old, I'm afraid. So that's one child and three adults. Any idea where you'd like to sit? Stalls or circle? Uh, Tickets for the stalls are a bit more expensive. £12 for adults and £8.50 for children. The circle costs £10.50 and £6.50. Do you get a good view from the circle? Oh, yes. And in fact, we've got some seats left at the front, if you'd like those. Right. We'll go for those, then. Right. That's seats A21 to 24, then. They're very good seats. That sounds fine. So let's see, that comes to £38 altogether for the tickets. How do you want to collect them? Shall I put them in the post? They'd be sent today by first class mail and there'd be an additional charge of £1 to cover postage and administration. Or do you want to get them from the box office yourself? Oh yes, could you send them please? No problem. That'll be £39 altogether. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. So at this point, you should be highlighting um, type, number, name. Additional is a keyword book. You'll see with the name for question seven, they've got the title, Mr. J is a 
is the first name, but for here we're looking for the now listen name, and uh, answer surname. questions five to ten. Could I just take your card details? What kind of card is it? Visa? Switch? Mastercard. Okay. And the number? It's three two nine zero five eight seven six double four zero one two eight double nine. Two eight double nine. Okay. And the name on the card, please. It's Mr. J. Witten. W H I double T O N. N for never or M for mother? N for never. Thank you. And now I've nearly finished, but I just need your address and postcode. Yes, it's 42 South Street. OK. Is that Plymouth? London. And the postcode? It's SW25GE. That's fine, then. The ticket should be with you tomorrow. Is there anything else I can do for you? Yes. I was wondering if I could get regular information about what's on. Certainly. I can just add your name to our mailing list. Would that be okay? That would be very good. Yes, please. Oh, and there is something else. Sorry. One of our group is hard of hearing, and I've heard that you can supply special headphones. That's right. As long as you tell us in advance, we can always do that. I'll book those for you now, and you can just collect them from the box office before the show. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. And then they will say, you now have half, well, we shall begin. You have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, so let's just have a look through at some of the options here for the answers. The date is Saturday the 26th. Now, um, with dates, be careful if you're doing something like 21st ST, 22nd ND, 23rd RD. So that's one, one thing to be careful of. That has to be correct as well. Um, if you're doing a, a month and a day, the order doesn't matter. You could put the 26th of June or June 26th. That's okay. I don't really recommend putting numbers only for a day and a month. Um, if you put one stroke 12, you have to be careful. Does that mean the 1st of December? Or does it mean the 12th of January? Because in the US, they will put uh, month first, then day, for example. So watch out for that. Uh, time, they said seven o'clock. Uh, there's a few options for you. Now, just be careful in the question. If they mention, if PM or AM is already mentioned in the question, don't duplicate. Just write the number only. Uh, but if, this, if PM is not mentioned, then you can add PM. In the circle, that's where the seats are, and the row numbers, they have a range here, A21 to 24. You can put a dash in cases like that. Uh, MasterCard, that's the type, and there's the number. So interestingly, some people have difficulty in processing this one. You can look at each individual number, and of course you can understand it well, but sometimes when they give a credit card number or uh, some kind of number that's quite long, um, it can be difficult to process and write them down correctly. So try and practice that one if you can as well. Sometimes be careful, they will also maybe make an error with the number. Uh, two, nine, uh, or, or two, eight, eight, nine. Oh no, sorry, I mean two, eight, nine, nine. So they'll do things like that with corrections as well. Sometimes they'll give you a name of a person, but in this particular case, they will normally spell it for you. Make sure your spelling is correct. One other issue is, is spelling. So you'll see here, headphones is actually one word, not two words. If you write it as two words, it's marked as incorrect. The same thing also um, applies to words that are hyphenated. Um, look at the word good looking. There's actually a hyphen or a dash in the middle. You have to do that, otherwise it's marked as incorrect.
Uh, and there's no problem if you have American spelling or British spelling, that doesn't matter. That's not marked as, as incorrect. Um, but in the word headphones, if you put F instead of PH, that would be marked as wrong. So spelling is, is actually quite important in the IELTS listening test. So let's think about some uh, general listening advice. They do give you time to preview the questions. Use your time to read the questions. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15 or something like that. Um, see the topics, look at the headings, and that'll give you some idea of, of what to expect. Use that time to highlight uh, some of the keywords to help you focus. Yeah, so underlining keywords, but be careful, don't underline everything, then you can't see the keywords. Maybe you might want to underline to a circle or a box or an asterisk. Use a variety of labeling to make, make, the, make everything stand out. Don't forget, if you're doing the computer delivered test, you can still highlight on the screen. That's also possible as well. Synonyms. This is incredibly important. Actually, it's really important in all parts of the IELTS test, of course, in uh, speaking and writing, of course, in the reading, as I mentioned earlier, but also in the listening. Um, if the question uses the word start, maybe the speaker is going to use the word begin or something like that. Finding synonyms is quite important. Um, but actually finding sometimes in the in the later sections like section three or section four it can be not as obvious so start and begin i think that's an obvious paraphrase but some one that's not as obvious could be the word dislike but maybe the speaker might say hmm, i'm not overly fond of that i'm not own, overly fond of so that whole phrase means i don't like so watch out, and then also in, in cases like that, watch out for negatives. I'm, I'm not overly fond of. If you just hear fond of, oh, that means you like it. But look out for the negative. There are lots of negatives that um, can change meaning as well. The questions are in order, which is great. They're not jumbled like some of the reading ones are. Um, but as I said, remember to keep an eye on, you know, two or three at, at the same time. Stick to the word limit, same as the reading. So if it says no more than two words, stick to no more than two words or one word only, just have one word only. One thing to be careful of, and this also applies in the listening, is that don't duplicate because sometimes there's a word in the question um, and you're mentioning it a second time. Um, um, maybe the question uses the word first, but the speaker says initial advice or in initial um, information. So if the word says first, don't write um, initial information because initial and first have the same meaning. Don't duplicate. So watch out for things like that. That's also applies to the synonyms as well. Intonation helps. I think intonation especially helps in section three when you've got the two different speakers. Um, and sometimes they'll change direction. I was expecting the test to be quite easy, but in fact, it was quite the opposite. I was expecting it to be quite easy. So you listen to the intonation. So sometimes the intonation can give you meaning. Look at um, uh, using the word quite, and maybe some of you are, are familiar with this. How was the movie? Well, it was, it was quite good falling intonation, a bit negative. How was the movie? Oh, it was quite good. 
rising intonation. So that can change meaning. Sometimes the intonation can be very subtle. So watch out for things like that in, um, in section three in particular, especially when two people or three people are, are discussing. And in sometimes in section three, they have to maybe agree on a topic or something like that. Um, do you think this is, a, this is a suitable idea? Ask your question. Mm, possibly falling intonation, maybe I'm thinking no, the person is indicating a no. So watch out for that. So um, summary of the masterclass, let's look at a few things. Make the most of, most of every opportunity to use English. Use English as much as you can. Now, I know some of you may be um, using your first language at home, and that's, a, that's understandable. Maybe if with one of your family members, you can try to just give 10 minutes at home just to use it, practice a bit of English outside home. Try to use as much English as you can. But also don't forget you can watch things. You can watch TED Talks or um, read some news in English. Um, maybe do a practice writing at home. Use as much English as you can. The more you use, the better. Set targets for your preparation. I think with this particular point, I think, I know a lot of people say, I, I want band eight, I need band seven. And that's great to have a big goal like that. But for every big goal, it's important to have shorter targets as well. If you have smaller goals, that can keep or help sustain your motivation. So you're saying, I want band eight, that's good. But saying, oh, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to have a little vocab list that I'm going to review it for, for 10 minutes every day on the bus when I go to work or go to school. Um, and I want to accumulate um, 50 new words a week or 10 new words a day or five new words a day. Something small like that is achievable. Have smaller tasks and smaller targets in your preparation um, and make it realistic as well. Make sure you're choosing the right test, academic or general. Or oh, by the way, in the listening test and the speaking test, it, there's no difference at all. It's exactly the same thing. Academic and general just vary according to writing and reading. Understand the scoring. Um, reading and listening, the particular raw score out of 40 gets converted into a band score. Um, IELTS preparation courses, they're very handy to do, um, but just IELTS only. Um, do IELTS preparation uh, in conjunction with or combined with other kinds of English practice. You can read IELTS articles, sure, but maybe read a novel for enjoyment. Um, if you love sport, if you love football, why not read about your football team in English? That kind of thing. Okay, so if you're aiming for a seven, and I know a lot of people are, that's a, are, that's a lot of time, you need a lot of time, thousands of hours, really, to get to that kind of level. So, you know, you can get these little tips, which are great, but at the end of the day, the higher, with the higher bands, you do need to put in the hours and use the English and practice. Um, Long-term approach is handy, be it realistic. You can't go from band five to band eight in a week. Anything you can do in English helps you. Uh, whatever you can do, uh, interacting with people, um, listening to, to the news or something like that. Push yourself every day, everywhere, wherever you can. All right, so there are some good resources for you. As you can see here, IELTS.com or IELTS Essentials. Uh, with tips and practice tests and other support videos and things like that. Um, please check check that out. And really the last thing, oh, so one thing to mention, there's IELTS uh, progress check. Um, you can choose academic or general. Uh, you can do uh, writing, reading, speaking, listening, and you get a detailed report with an indication of what you would expect. Um, 
in your test. So if you want to get a good idea, you could try one of these. Uh, we've got um, our, it's our asking anything session. We've got one of these, one coming up on Thursday, the 3rd of December, 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Um, so look at that, free to join one of our, one of our webinars. Ask me anything well. And that leaves us with the question session. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. Excellent. Uh, that was a spectacular masterclass, Rocco. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed presenting. I'm sure everyone enjoyed uh, being on the receiving end of that masterclass. It was, I think, really great. Uh, we've had a lot of listening and reading questions come in from all across the globe from a variety of test takers. So uh, we're going to kick off. Uh, first question. Uh, is it okay if I write all of my answers in capital letters or lowercase for both the IELTS listening and reading tests? Uh, yes, it is. Just make sure that your spelling is correct. Um, the capital letters is actually not a bad idea because sometimes when people do the lowercase, sometimes, you know, for example, C and E, if you're not careful, that can kind of almost look, look the same. So um, just watch out for that. Capital letters isn't actually not a bad idea. Spectacular. Uh, I've had a question come from a test taker saying, time management in the reading test is a big issue for me. Last month I appeared for my IELTS general training and by the end I had very little time to read the last passage. My question is how can we best manage our time during that test? Mm. Um, it is, it, it's interesting. Sometimes people can be, they're very good readers. They can read a passage and understand it perfectly, but then it's trying to process those questions. Um, I think in terms of time management, I think you have to, um, it's all about prioritizing, doing things in a particular order. For example, I mentioned earlier, there are some questions, maybe don't do them first. They might appear first, like which paragraph contains this particular question. If they mention that first, leave it to last, jump to the other questions, do the multiple choice first or the true false not given first. Um, so pick which questions to do first and within that group of questions, which number do I do first? Always try the ones perhaps with the people's names, prioritize. Find out which, and I mentioned them earlier, which questions are can be found in order. Quite often they're the good ones to do first because orientation, oh, I can begin with the second question first because I can see the person's name. So doing that. And of course, practice. So my advice is also perhaps look at, look at your techniques that you're doing for your question. What is your strategy for headings or what is your strategy for true, false, not given? Practice the strategy at home, get comfortable with the strategy and then work on improving the strategy. So if you're at home, I don't recommend just doing a one hour reading test all the time. Do a reading test and get comfortable with your strategies. And then once, you, once you've done that, if you take 90 minutes for a practice test, that's fine. Next time take 85, next time take 80, and just see if you can progressively work towards getting it done within an hour or within 50 minutes or 55 minutes, allowing time to, to check your answer. That was a great answer. Thank you, Rocco. Uh, next question. How should I prepare if I know how to speak English, but I don't know where to start studying for the IELTS? What topics should I cover to reduce the amount of mistakes I can make? Well, the thing is, in the, in the IELTS test, you, you can get a variety of topics. So I think it comes to organizing your notes. I don't think there are really mis you can make mistakes from, from a topic. Perhaps you can maybe lack some ideas in a topic, but that's okay. In reading and listening, it's about identifying language. The vocabulary won't be too specific. So you don't have to have, no, look, I know nothing about marketing and there's an article about marketing. How can I answer it? It doesn't matter because the, you, you just, the articles are, are of a general knowledge. You don't need to be an expert in the field. However, I recommend organizing your uh, notes into themes. Have a topic on education, have a topic on technology have a topic on health. And in that you collect articles, writing questions, speaking tasks, uh, listening material with recordings and everything. Keep them in the one folder and 
spread out as many topics as you like uh, and then and do it that way that's more to, to help you with ideas and familiarity but at the end of the day you don't need to be an expert on the topic to be able to answer the questions another great answer thank you uh next question do i need to listen closely to the entire recording or should i aim just to listen out for specific keywords Ooh. Ooh. um the the keywords are really really important they they can tell you where where you are or um tell you what to expect you know just before the answer but i do feel you, you need to process the whole the whole part of it you know you, you otherwise you'll miss key things where they're changing direction there's a thing called signposting it helps you orientate where they are where the speaker is um you can pick up lots of things like all the negatives i mentioned like words like not or i was expecting i thought hmm that's in you know <clears throat> you can pick up uh, lots of sign thing signposting things like um, however hmm, having said that so that changes direction nowadays even the word nowadays is important maybe you're contrasting between the past and now so i do feel you, you need to be able to process the majority of, of what the speakers are saying excellent thank you very much next question uh, is it common to have long number strings not repeated during the ielts test in all of my preparation materials there has always been a reputation a repetition of these they will normally um in this particular case we did today they just repeated the end bit which is by then you're kind of struggling um sometimes i'll make an error and you know is it um one three two four right one two three four no 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 i said one three two four ah oh, sorry i got the two and so they'll do things to like that to confuse you so number strings they might include um some repetition but some discrepancy some discussion because there's an error and they might use things like the speaker might say double eight oh three and then the person re repeats with eight eight oh three and that can happen as well that's really good to know thank you uh next question how many correct answers are required in academic reading to acquire a band score of six um from memory i think it's maybe roughly 24 from maybe 24 25 or 26 will give you band six roughly but it does vary because some particular tests um it might be a bit higher it might be at 25 some might be a bit lower at 24. if it's sometimes it depends on the degree of difficulty if it's in slightly easier they will raise it if it's slightly more difficult they will drop it um my understanding is it's not always fixed in every test excellent answer thank you very much uh this next question is a step up from that one uh okay. how can i perform at a band nine level in ielts listening wow <laughs> now um i do feel there's probably two things to do uh of course test familiarization is really important um doing uh, practice tests is important so you're familiar with all the question types and if you do if you do a few of them you can maybe see ah i tend to struggle with the multiple choice so identify your weaknesses and work on them but the main thing outside of practice tests i think is being able to listen to extended extended listening so this is where people get thrown that they can have a conversation with a friend and understand and hear everything perfectly but can you actually sit down and listen to uh, a ted talk or a lecture um, and make it longer now an ielts lecture in section four is maybe five six seven minutes do longer ones can you sustain concentration for 10 or 15 minutes news is handy but news they, they cut They'll, they'll talk for 30 seconds and cut cut away and come back there's a lot of contrasting can you listen to one speaker consistently and do it as a listening a note-taking task you don't have to do ielts questions but longer than ielts so ielts is maybe five six seven minutes can you do it for longer 12 minutes 15 minutes 
listening to a lecture and, and source them on the internet and just do it as a listening and note taking task. See how long you can concentrate for. But that's the other thing is you can, even native speakers do it. They can listen to IELTS and then they can just zone out. Well, oh, that's right. I'm doing a practice test and they can miss something because of the concentration. Focus, good rest and good sleep can do it as well. Remove distractions. Are you good at blocking out distractions? That's pretty much it. Amazing, amazing answer, Marco. Thank you very much. That was, um, I imagine, quite a complicated question. I think you delivered a really good answer. Uh, this next question, hopefully, will have a simpler answer. Um, are we able to write T, F, and N, G instead of true, false, and not given on the test without being marked incorrectly? My advice is write the full word because I've seen people put a T and an F. What, what is that? Or a no and NG. Sometimes when people are rushing, the, the no and the NG look very similar. Just write the, write the full word and then you avoid any confusion. Excellent, thank you. Uh, similar question, is adding extra detail going to result in an incorrect answer in, in, sorry, in sections one and four of the listening test? For instance, if I wrote special headphones for question eight, not simply headphones, would that be marked as incorrect? First look at the word limit. If it says no more than two words, that's fine. And also if the word special is not mentioned somehow already in the question, um, what's a good synonym for special? Like um, particular, and then don't mention it because it's kind of paraphrased. But I think the additional words are important. So if the, if the speaker says part-time job and you just write job only, that's not a complete answer you need to write part-time because um, I think if there's an adjective, if the answer is a noun and they offer an adjective, usually it's a good idea to include it because it's extra definition. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, next question. In the academic reading test, is the level and difficulty of the three passages higher and hardest in the third passage? It can be. Sometimes there's like a real kind of factual article sometimes there that some of them are like this the ones that are more about discussing a story and more first or second the third one tends to be factual but sometimes it can be the second one as well but generally speaking one one of them is a, is a factual one excellent thank you very much uh next question how can i improve my listening skill within one week uh sometimes i cannot understand some unfamiliar unfamiliar words due to the accent Aha, uh -huh. then get, well, look, they do use a variety of accents in, in IELTS. So I think it's good, go to something YouTube like that, where you just listen to some speakers, um, like Australian accent or New Zealand accent or a British accent, American accent, and just get familiar. And sometimes people have done these little videos and I'll tell you how, um, how sometimes they're contrasted. Um, sometimes they're fun, they're fun ones and sometimes they're kind of a serious one. Um, or just source things like, you know, Australian news is a good one. Australian news, just even look at that on the internet and then go to New Zealand news, Canadian news, maybe even the same news story if something has happened uh, and it's gone around the world. And quite often it's been reported by a number of different news agencies. So then you'll get to hear the different accents and, and, and people talking about the same thing in a, in a different accent. Amazing answer, thank you. Uh, this is gonna be our last question for the night. Uh, which do you recommend? Taking skills, sorry, taking a class for skills I'm better at so I can sharpen those skills up or taking a class for skills I'm lacking in? Well, that depends because Sometimes people say, look, I need seven overall, but nothing less than a six. So sometimes it might be better to go higher with, with one and still get the average of seven. But at the same time, um, those kind of requirements are normally within half a band. It can be useful to look at the weaker ones. And don't forget, there's a lot of, in IELTS, there's a lot of... Um, crossover with the marking so if you think with reading no i'm going to focus on reading not writing but don't forget spelling is part of it isn't it and um 
And even with, I'm not going to practice listing, it's my weaker one, speaking is my stronger one, but still in the listing test, you have to listen. Maybe it's worth trying to even out your skills to make sure you have more, more opportunities and you're not penalized because of one skills held you back. Excellent. I think that was a great answer to end on. Um, unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for tonight. Uh, remember, if you, we weren't able to answer your question, you can just send, that to, send it to us directly on Facebook and we will get back to you with an answer. Um, a huge thank you to you, Rocco, for running us through that masterclass tonight and to everyone who was able to tune in, whether you're watching live or via the recording. Uh, if you're looking for more study tips, we'd recommend heading to our website, IELTS.com, uh, or following us on IELTS Essentials from IDP on Facebook, IELTS.Essentials on Instagram, or just IELTS on TikTok. Uh, have a great afternoon, morning, night, or evening, depending on where you are. And again, thank you very much. Goodbye. Great to have you guys. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye.